All right, welcome everybody who's just coming in. Thank you for being here. We'll give it a couple minutes um, to let uh, other people kind of filter in, but welcome. Really grateful to have you here today. Thanks for taking the time. If you'd like, you can uh, open up the chat there and type in um, your name and where you're coming from today. Always fun to see where we have people joining us um, from uh, different areas of New Jersey, New York, uh, and around the country. So welcome to everyone. Feel free to share your name, where you're coming from today. Allison's coming from Southampton, New York. Welcome. <clears throat> Mariella from Brooklyn, welcome. Someone from Staten Island, Camden, awesome, welcome. Sussex County, Lancaster, PA, Flanders, New Jersey. <clears throat> Princeton YMCA, hey Mary, welcome. Jerry, you got a special shout out from Edith, Union City High School, awesome. Bradley, New Jersey, Casa of Morris and Sussex and Morristown, welcome. Hamilton, awesome. Welcome to everybody who's just joining us. We're gonna give it a couple minutes for people to come in. <clears throat> like to sh share your name, where you're coming from. Connecticut, Brooklyn, awesome. All right, we are gonna go ahead and get started. <clears throat> um, we are recording the session today, just to give everybody a heads up on that, and um, we will plan to make this session available uh, following uh, the webinar. Um, Welcome uh, to this webinar on the road back to school. Today we are going to explore current events and the ways in which schools have been adapting and planning for the return to school in the fall, whatever that looks like in this very fluid situation that we find ourselves in. My name is Jesse Bassett and I'm the Director of Education at Good Grief. I'm joined today by a colleague who also works in the field of childhood bereavement, Lisa Zeitz. Uh, Lisa, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Lisa's going to be helping me to moderate this session. Sure. So I'm Lisa Zeitz. I'm a social worker by training, and I've been working in the fields of bereavement and end-of-life care for ever, <laughs> 25 years plus. Um, and I work alongside Good Grief and in other, I really specialize in working in schools in the wake of tragedy, but also um, doing preparedness training. Um, for schools and school professionals. And I also have wor had a long career working in a program very much like Good Grief with families experiencing the loss of a parent or a child. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for being here, Lisa. I really appreciate it. And excited for you to, to share your experience and uh, perspective today. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and dive in, but I wanna start from a place of gratitude and say thank you to each of you for setting aside the time to engage in this incredibly important conversation. Um, I'm joined today, Lisa and I are joined today by three panelists um, who we're gonna introduce after I do a little bit of setting up uh, the context, but I also wanna say thank you to the three of them for being here too, to share their experience and their voices, because I think this conversation will be um, much more valuable for it. So thank you to the three of you for being here. For those of you who are new to us, to Good Grief, uh, we're a nonprofit organization that's been around in New Jersey since 2004. Our mission is to build resilience in children, strengthen families, and empower communities to grow from loss and adversity. For most of the organization's history, we've been providing free and unlimited support programs to grieving children and families, starting as young as three years old uh, through young adulthood. But in recent years, our work has been growing and evolving through education and advocacy 
to provide training, curriculum, and resources to schools, hospitals, and other healthcare organizations, the funeral industry, corporations, and other spaces to empower professionals, parents, and the broader community to support the needs of children and family, families who are facing loss and adversity in their lives. It's a little bit about who we are. If you want to learn more, you can always visit our website, good-grief.org. So here are our topics today. It's important for me to state that what we will not be discussing today, just as much as what we will be discussing. Our main objective is to talk about the ongoing impact of COVID-19 on students, faculty, administrators, families, and our communities uh, through the continued stress, anxiety, grief, and trauma that we, have, that we all have been experiencing. In preparation for this, we felt it was really important to stay away from any discussions related to protocols, state guidelines, and other logistical challenges um, that are a significant reality and hurdle for many schools this year, but not something that we wanted to um, address in our time together. We will talk about them to the extent that it, that context shapes significantly our experience of the classroom. This can't be denied. Um, they are at the center of increasing collective uncertainty, stress, even hopelessness, overwhelm, and more. However, we do not want this webinar to get bogged down by comparing plans, safety protocols, rumors, or the twists and turns of a particular school or district. As we know, these things are twisting and turning every single day. Um, it's a very fluid situation. But the emotional, relational, and mental health toll that is being felt by all is not fluid. And this is what we seek to address in this moment. Our, our attempt is to try to pull us collectively back, slow down, take stock, and try to speak to the broader themes related to the collective grief, trauma, and pain that we all share. So we hope to do that in that time. And by addressing that pain and that grief, we can find some common ground and a shared purpose on how we can move forward together. So with that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our current context. This spring, I did a series of four webinars and each of them we talked about building resilience through loss. Um, and I talked a lot about the context of COVID-19, its impact, honestly, without really thinking that this would be a continued conversation in the fall. But as we know, this is still going on much longer than I think any of us anticipated, especially at the beginning of this pandemic. And the death toll in grief continues to rise. Jobs continue to be lost. Businesses continue to close down. The economy is in just as bad, if not worse, state than it was in the spring. So fair to say that we find ourselves in a state of continued and increased grief and loss in our communities. There has also been a lot of increased uncertainty, and I think fair to say even frustration. Um, and let's name some of the reasons why. These are all things that I have heard in talking to people, and uh, as Lisa has talked to people as well as we were kind of preparing for this. Many of our parents are overwhelmed at the prospect of continuing to do school remotely while juggling the demands of their own jobs. At these jobs, their bosses are starting to lose patience and understanding of flexibility and remote work as their own pressures are mounting with businesses going very poorly. And parents wonder, especially those who do not have the means to participate in pods or hire tutors or move their children into private schools, how they will make it through another school year like things were in the spring. Many of our teachers do not wanna come back into the classrooms this fall with good reason. Many are above, uh, above the age or have pre-existing uh, health conditions that would put them at risk if they were exposed to the virus. Others have elderly parents or family members that they take care of or are living in their homes. What if they bring the virus back from school? And still others simply do not have the faith in leadership or our government to provide them with the resources and information to keep them safe. Many student um, support staff, counselors, social workers, others feel the, the same as teachers, but they are also keenly aware of the ongoing crisis to the social and emotional well-being that this situation places on our students, especially those who are more at risk when they are stuck at home because of abuse, neglect, poverty, 
or other factors that um, that really um, uh, create a really complex environment for our kids. And administrators um, are in the hot seat, to say the least. They are having to make really, really difficult decisions. And they want to keep their students, teachers, and others safe. But they are also feeling the pressures to return to school in some form as quickly and as safely as possible. And this doesn't even begin to mention our students, and we can't forget our kids. Who, live, um, who are living through what will be a life-defining moment for them. This experience will shape their perspective of the world, for better or for worse. It will impact their education, relationships, and opportunities in the future, especially those who are already most at risk. And to top that all off, our country has been going through a crisis in reawakening to the realities of ongoing racism police brutality and injustice in our communities of color, the likes of which has not been seen since the civil rights movement in the 1960s. This also is a defining moment for our children and for our communities. <sighs> what a context, right? All of this can feel very, very overwhelming. It can feel disempowering and can drive more disconnection and more tension among our relationships and in our communities. And I think it's really important for me in the seat that I'm sitting in with the work that we do at Good Grief to remind all of us that amidst all of this, we have the continued what we can call usual losses and adversities that our communities face on a regular basis. And we can't lose sight of these. Their impact remains and has the potential to get exacerbated by this pandemic. And just a few stats, and I know I've shared some of these in the spring if you've been in previous workshops, but just to remind us, about 75% of children will face one of these hardships or adversities um, or more by the age of 20. And 80% of kids who are exposed to one of these adversities will uh, live with at least one more and 50% of kids who grew up with one of these adverse experiences will be exposed to three or more. So we know that childhood adversity already has a way of kind of piling up and cascading in an individual's life, especially for those kids who are most at risk. And coming into the school year, we can expect to see significant shifts in behavior and capacity for learning. Um, all of this comes from research on grief and trauma-informed care. Some common reactions um, to trauma and loss include things like increased fear or nervousness, anxiety and depression, withdrawal and isolation, impulsivity and aggression, difficulty concentrating and planning, misinterpreting potential threats, increased vigilance and suspicion, a narrowed sense of time, and a lot of somatic complaints like stomach aches, headaches, things like that. So likely you will see a lot of these kinds of things, whether you are in a hybrid, virtual, or in-person model. The question that we're asking ourselves, we've been thinking about this is, okay, so we have this road back to school, but what does the road forward look like? The road back to school is filled with many challenges, which I've just noted, but, and this is, I think, something that's really important for our conversation today, there are also many opportunities, many opportunities for learning, growth, connection, and developing resilience. How can we move forward together? How can we build resilience in our students, coworkers, and families through this experience? What do we need to focus our time and our energy on? And as Lisa and I were planning for this and talking about it, one of the things we kept coming back to is there are some real parallels between this moment we find ourselves in and the kind of experience that um, the grieving families we work with every single day. There are these lessons from loss that are really applicable to this moment in time. So I thought I would just share some of those some things that we were thinking about before. Um, next, we're gonna introduce our panel and open up that discussion. So with loss, the world often feels out of control. And 
In that and through it, we often learn how to cope with the unknown. With loss, we go through a roller coaster of negative emotions, including sadness, stress, anxiety, uncertainty, anger, and guilt. Any of these found, sound familiar? Um, and through that experience, we learn that while the negative emotions are hard, they help you to rebuild and to make meaning out of that experience. With loss, we have to learn or relearn how to do lots of different things in our lives. And through that experience, we step in through new doors into the unknown and find out that we can do more than we ever thought was possible before. With loss, we are often the recipients of lots of unsolicited advice. Um, and one of the things we learn through loss is that people have good intentions, but we can learn how to empathize better, better with the pain of others having gone through it ourselves. With loss, reactions to the same loss vary even within uh, an, uh, the same family, which can lead to conflict at times. Um, and one of the things we learn through that experience is that um, communication and working through the most challenging of situations, or we learn how to communicate and work through the most challenging of situations with those that we love. With loss, our faith and trust in people, institutions, and higher power can be shaken, but we oftentimes learn that we are not responsible. Um, we learn that those people are not responsible for our pain or the sense of meaning or purpose that we find in our lives. And finally, with loss, People you thought would show up for you often do not, but others surprise you. And what, so one of the things that we learn is that your friendships narrow, but they are deeper and more fulfilling. And so in a similar way, oh, sorry, I skipped around here. Um, we are going to now open up for a conversation around um, this current context and what we can learn from it and how we move forward. So I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa who's going to introduce our guests. Um, again, before she does that, I just wanna thank them once again for being here. Each of them brings a unique perspective and experience to this discussion. And we felt it was really important to include both educators and a parent in this conversation. So thank you so much for being here. And Lisa, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. It's really my honor to introduce these three panelists. And again, I echo Jesse in thanking you for taking time at this juncture in particular when things are so overwhelming for you. So forgive me while I read. Um, I'll start with Jesse or Jessica. Um, Jessica Chuck Goldman, LCSW, is the school social worker at Stuyvesant High School in Lower Manhattan. She is currently a doctoral candidate at NYU School of Social Work, focusing on restructuring how mental health and suicidal ideation are addressed within the Department of Education, the DOE. She is a guest lecturer at NYU School of Social Work, Lehman College School of Social Work, and a member of the DOE Guidance Leadership Committee, working with school social workers and school counselors to address racism and oppression in the DOE. She also started the first peer-to-peer -peer support group for school clinicians, providing peer supervision regarding the upswing of suicidal ideation, self-harm, and drug use in middle and high schools. She has two years of advanced clinical training at the Ackerman Institute for the Family and is the advisor to Stuyvesant's LGBTQ Club. So thank you, Jesse. And secondly, um, Jerry Perez is the Assistant Superintendent of Schools in Union City, New Jersey. She has worked for the Union City School District for the past 28 years, serving as a teacher, assistant principal, and principal prior to her current position. She is currently in charge of student services, overseeing support services. Mrs. Perez believes it is important to get to know students well in order to best support their academic and social emotional growth. So thank you, Jerry. And finally, we have Melissa. Melissa Hutchinson is a 35-year-old hardworking, you can tell, <laughs> and loving mother to her 10-year-old son, London McRae. Melissa grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and now resides in Hamilton, New Jersey. She holds a bachelor's degree from St. John's University in Queens and works as a surgical schedule, scheduler at, I guess, the Robert Wood Johnson VH Hospital in Hamilton. Melissa and London have been attending Good Grief's peer support programs for two years since the tragic death of her son's father and her love, Kenneth McRae. 
Jr. In Melissa's words, good grief has become a safe place for my son and I since the death of my son's father due to a drunk driver. Healing after such a great loss has been challenging but achievable with support from family, friends, and great organizations like Good Grief, unquote. Melissa atten attends St. Mark, Mark United Methodist Church in Hamilton and is a PTA member and room representative at her son's elementary school. This is a busy bunch. So I just wanted to start, and I think we'll go in the same order if that's okay, Jesse and then Jerry and then Melissa. Just if you would, again, share your names, um, any other biographical info that I missed or something that might be relevant to this conversation today and how you, maybe a single word or a phrase to describe how emotionally, how you're feeling right now in this time and why this topic spoke to you while you're joining us today. So thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, I, I feel two feelings right now. One is I'm excited for the year to start. I love the work I do. I love working with kids and with families and I'm ready. That said, I feel a little like I'm floating. I don't feel grounded at all because there's so much uncertainty about what is to come um, in so many areas. Um, both the school year starting, where we're gonna be, what we are gonna be around with kids and families. So yeah, I feel a little floating right now. Hi everyone, Jerry Perez. Um, how I'm feeling right now, I would have to say is apprehensive. I'm, I'm, I'm nervous because uh, quite honestly, I don't know what to expect. I don't, I don't feel like I have complete control over things that I previously had control over. So I'm a little nervous because I always want to do the very, very best that I can. But that being said, I feel determined. I feel, I feel like whatever this is going to throw at us, we are going to, we are going to meet it, we're gonna match it, and we're gonna get through it. And, and, and I'm feeling both of those things at the same time, sometimes simultaneously, and it's, it, it, it's challenging to control how you feel right now. Alyssa, your turn. <laughs> Hi, I'm feeling, I would say I'm torn between, um, I'm kind of excited to get the year uh, started because my son's going to fifth grade and that's um, the last chapter of elementary towards uh, middle school. And then um, also um, a little anxious because I'm like, how's this gonna go with um, uh, remote learning and then possible hybrid learning? Um, so that's w what I'm feeling right now. Thank you everybody for, for sharing. I, I just wanted to jump in with, um, I guess we could call them speed round, though I don't expect you to talk quickly, but more kind of the idea that, um, a couple questions that, um, just wanted to kind of get some quick responses on to, to kind of get our wheels churning here. Tell us one thing that you are, we'll start here, one thing that you're most concerned about for your students, your colleagues, and yourselves heading into the school year. Um, and in your case, Melissa, for, for you and your family and, and your friends and um, people that you surround yourself with. And then what is one thing that you're looking forward to? So something you're concerned about, most concerned about, and something that you are looking forward to. Whoever would like to go first can go first. I'll go first. Okay, so um, concerns. I, I'm, I'm very concerned for our students because we've been away from them for so long. I, I'm worried that um, because we're going to start our school year virtually and we don't physically get to see them, I'm worried about how much support um, they're going to have. I'm worried for, the, for their families because they, they're working families and they may not have, you know, they may not have the they're going to make choices between work and, and, and being there for school. So I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned for my um, coworkers too, because coming back to work presents them with childcare issues because schools are in a, in a state of flux. All different schools are, are, you know, handling this in different ways. So there's not something, something very consistent. And myself, I'm, I'm, I'm in that rare situation where I am 
um, I'm part of the community I work in. I'm, I'm an administrator in Union City, but I live in Union City and I'm, my neighbors are the parents and we're all kind of one big, uh, it's a big town, but it's, it's a very close knit town. Everybody kind of knows each other. So I, I fit in many places with, within the town and I, I'm experiencing the same things. My childcare issues are an issue. Like I, it, it's, the, it's the same and um, it's, it, it, it's a concern just basically for everybody. But I'm also excited that school is gonna resume in whatever format it resumes because there is that contact. It's a, it's a more steady contact. Even if it's virtual, we're gonna see our kids and we're gonna connect with our kids and we're gonna be able to connect with parents in, in a much more consistent manner than we could before. So um, to, to find a positive in it, it, it's that. Even if it's not the type of interaction we're accustomed to, it, it, there will be more. Thanks, Jerry. I'll go. Um, I, I'm, I'm concerned. I, I work with adolescents and um, I, you know, this is the stage of development where kids are really supposed to be pushing away from their parents and really finding the most connection with peers, with outside people. And um, what COVID has done is it has made families um, the primary source of interaction. And I think what a lot of families are finding from the clinical work I'm doing is that there's a lot of tension in the home because of this. Um, there's resentment from kids. There's resentment from parents in many ways because, you know, they are parenting, teaching, um, doing behavioral work. And they're, they're doing it all. And on top of their own internal frustration and what they are working through being isolated as well. Um, so the isolation really to me is something um, I really worry about with the kids and also myself as a clinician. Um, can I be doing the work I want to be doing um, and should be doing if I am estranged from the students? And I found that last semester um, with really relying on kids to reach out to me or their peers to reach out to me or their parents to reach out to me if they're worried about their friends or themselves, um, which is something that, again, in adolescence, is, does not come naturally to just say, hey, I'm in a really terrible place. I need help today. Or I'm having suicidal ideation. Please help me. It's really... Um, I'm a step removed as a clinician, and I feel a little bit of, you know, kind of crossing my fingers, hoping um, that people will come to me. Um, I relate a lot to the kids. Um, I think there's a reason we all work in schools or work in, and I know for you, Melissa, you work in a hospital, so you're someone who also likes to engage and interact with people. Um, it's very isolating and lonely for us as well. Um, you know, we didn't sign up to be at home and doing this work. I work in a 3,400 uh, student school. I like being around thousands of people a day. Um, that said, so, so yes, the isolation and loneliness, I think, is just not, it's just not normal, healthy, um, and it's hard to manage for everyone involved. Um, that said, I think kids actually... Um, you know, usually at the end of the summer, kids are like, oh man, I have to go back to school, homework, all of that. I think they're yearning for it. I think they're gonna be really reaching out to us and um, I'm excited to be engaging with kids again. Um, I'll go into this later, but I run a support group um, twice a week through the year and it was shocking how many kids like came to it. So, and I'll get into that later. But I think the interaction is gonna be great once we start again. Melissa, anything you're concerned about looking forward to for this upcoming year? Um, I'm just concerned. Um, my son's favorite part of school was recess. And <laughs> he said that was like the favorite part besides reading his um, comic books and his sci-fi books. Um, he also wants to be a comedian. So his thing is he likes to make people laugh um, since his father passed. He, that was his outlet at making people happy and making people laugh. So not everyone's sad. Um, 
So he's excited to go back, um, but he's also super terrified of going back. He doesn't want to get sick, but he does want to see his friends. So I'm just concerned about that part. And like you said earlier, um, he's yearning for that connection because being in a household with, um, there's no other kids in my house, he's the only child. He's like yearning for that connection. So I'm excited that he's going to see his friends more often. Uh, so far during the summer, it's been like Zoom meetings and like meet up at the park, you know, with our social distancing and masks. So hopefully, you know, this will be a good thing for him to go back to school. Thank you. The next question we have is related sort of to what Jesse was talking about, about the relationship of what we're all going through and grief, grief in its many forms. And so I wonder, and I guess this extends from families who are acutely grieving, because I know some of you are interacting with families who've experienced the death of someone from COVID or from other causes, as Jesse pointed out, life and risk goes on, as Melissa knows all too well. Um, so just if you would address sort of what's the pain, the grief, and the sorrow that you might be witnessing, it can be in your own community too, but also in the greater school community at the moment. Um, you know, and I just wonder, you know, if you guys could address that. We can start anywhere. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Melissa. Yeah, Melissa, you go, I think. Uh, we've had, uh, in my own family, I've had about five family members pass um, due to COVID. Um, in New York, well, my, most of my family's in New York, um, and we moved to Jersey. So it was hard because in the beginning, we couldn't actually travel um, to New York. Um, but then uh, we were able to go to one funeral. So my son and I actually went and that was just, um, it was, it was kind of good and bad because it's like you missed your family, even though we have all these precautions. Um, so it was a lot to deal with, but I feel like since we've been going to good grief and we had our own personal loss two years ago, um, it was like easier to handle it. Um, but uh, I don't even know how to describe it. Like at work, it's a difference because at work, I know I'm in the hospital, I know people are dying, but when you get a call, it's like a family member and then they're in another state and you guys are the two states with the most <laughs> COVID deaths, it's, it, it just took a lot. But I kind of want to um, put out there that I don't want people to get numb to it because I feel like now we're kind of getting this numbness like, oh, another person died from COVID? Okay. And I, I don't feel that's okay. I feel that we are getting like um, dehumanized or we're just getting colder. So I try to like make a point to take time to talk about it with my son. And he's like, you know, like it still hurts, like just don't brush it off as another COVID death. So. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, a tremendous point about not letting yourself get numb. I think that we've all been through such a time of so many, so many losses, so many different kinds of losses all at once that you almost stop, you almost stop feeling. And that's not what we want to do as people. We want to be able to feel even though it hurts. And, and that's, that's hard to remember to do because you don't like to do things that are, that are painful. Um, but a lot of the, the types of loss and, and the type of pain that I'm seeing with, with our kids and with our families is it's there, there have been, you know, physical loss of life and family members, um, but also the loss of the ability to grieve the way we traditionally do. Like people are dying and we can't go to their funerals. Um, we, we, uh, there are staff members that I worked with that passed. There was no closure on that. I didn't, we didn't say goodbye. We didn't, we didn't have an opportunity um, to, to attend any, any kind of ceremony. And that, that, you know, is a source of comfort if you can find comfort in, in loss. 
Um, and for, for kids, it, it, for the kids that we're working with, there's no support from, you know, that physical support from the school when you're going through that loss. We're not able to provide that. that, that that's some of the things that we're not. Um, and, and things that we do to get ourselves through. When we're stressed, we've lost that too, right? We've lost our outlets, our creative outlets, our entertainment, our, our cultural experiences. Sometimes when, when you're feeling down, you know, you want to, like we lost sports for a while. We've lost the arts. We've lost going to Broadway. We've lost, which are insignificant in comparison to what, you know, what we're talking about. But when we're, we're coping with grief and loss, we had a, a bank of things that seemed to work before that are not even available um, in, in the scheme of things. So. Um, it, there's just, it's just that word. It's like a black cloud loss. It's the loss of so much. It's the loss of what we understood and what we knew and, and trying to, you know, redefine that or, um, I don't know, and just work through it. I, I really, I appreciate what you both said. And, and, um, it, it's been really interesting. We had about a hundred students lose someone to COVID during this. Again, we're a 3,500 student school, so it's you know a small percentage with that. But um, kids are experiencing the individual loss and grief and trauma, but they're also experiencing the community trauma. And I think the balancing of the two, of the individual and how to deal with the grief and trauma of having a loss in a family, while at the same time, the community trauma, protecting yourself, needing to find ways to still exist during an entire trauma, um, is very hard to really touch base with the grieving process. Um, it was so interesting because I would run coping skills groups for kids about COVID and loneliness, isolation, anxiety, all of that, and tons of kids came. And when I sent out um, groups for uh, grief groups and just get, no one would show up, no one would come out. Um, granted, I work with mostly an Asian American community, and so there are certain cultural norms with kind of being really transparent about emotions and grief in that way. But that said, it was really, you know, I sent many referrals to kids, but um, it's uh, kids were not latching on to that. I think it really, as, as a culture and society, I, and I'm curious to hear the people who specialize in this, but why it is that people are not grasping on to um, processing the grief during a community trauma. I just find it interesting. But, you know, the resources, we're putting it out there and kids are not taking hold in the way that, you know, I was actually surprised. I mean, all your points are so well taken and interesting. And, and um, this is really the next question we had is really an extension of the same conversation. And Melissa, not to put you on the spot, but in my work, and I know Jesse feels the same way when you do this work, the experts are the families that we worked with. I mean, my cumulative knowledge is from working with families like yours for, you know, 20 plus years. And that's where I've learned my wisdom. And so I think that you... The next question we had was, and you've already addressed it to a certain extent, when you talk about that you're already educating people because of the journey you and your son have taken through grief, about cautioning people to numbness and to, and you already are wise in terms of continuing to have this ongoing conversation with him and with other people in your life. So I guess by extension of that, my the next question was really, what loss has taught you, and you already started to address that as this goes forward, and how you, you know, it's, you know, it's not just you, I'm sure London too can educate his peers and be a force for helping people develop the skills that they need to walk through this kind of grief and trauma. So I wonder if maybe you can continue, and all of you, to talk about what you can think of in terms of, um, and Jesse brings up a really interesting point too, which is maybe you even have insight as to why it's hard for people to, to access that point on, you know, like maybe even at what point you access good grief. You know, I mean, Jesse and I talked a little bit about, in my experience, we often say to people when they say, is it time to come? We don't have any fixed time tables, but we say to people is, sometimes you're so full of your own story you can't yet open yourself to other people's stories. That sometimes you need to walk that walk 
for a good long time. So that is a long introduction to this question, but I'll, Melissa, if you wouldn't mind starting that conversation. I would say um, I got introduced to Good Grief through the employee assistance program at my job. Um, I went back to work um, and my boss was like, you're not yourself. And she said, you know, maybe call this number and they referred me to Good Grief. And it was a safe place to go where other people had experienced it, but they didn't push their own thought as how to deal with it. And I, I think that's great because most people don't talk about grief as much. Now, now they are due to COVID, but before it was just like, kind of like mental health. Like, oh, you know, go to work, continue your routine, you'll get through it. Whereas um, now, with the pandemic is push people to really say this is a part of life just as if you know someone going through puberty or someone getting married is it's a part of life the grief so let's not just push it under the rug and just have a funeral and give them three days like <laughs> three days is not enough like i feel like two years has been you know just getting back to a new way of life new normal so I think it's taught me that you have um, you have to be in the moment of your life and really like say, okay, I enjoyed this moment. It has ended, but it's not the end of my life. Um, and it's it's really a lot. Like I talk more with my son because he feels like, mommy, do you remember daddy? Because I'm still going to work, still taking him to school. And he always says to me, like, he wants to talk about him because he was so young. Um, and he also said to me one time, I wish people, I wish I had a sign on my back that said my dad died because it's hard when they find out because some people react like, oh, you know, are you okay? Can I help you? Or what happened? Or they're just like, oh, okay, your dad died. So it's just like, sometimes he wants to get that part out of the way. Um, and it's, um, it's just hard for me to talk about it now because it's like you get all these emotions, but now I can talk about it. And I feel like um, it's taught me to really like appreciate um, the people I have in my life and the organizations and people who do have programs out there and that are doing this good work because there was really like a big question mark like, what do you do with grief? It's not like your grandma, your grandpa, this is like my son's father. And it was like, good grief had an answer where they had skills, like they had a place for him to go to get his aggression out. They had a, a place for him to like, you know, interact with other kids and not have that burden on their back, you know, to say like, oh, these kids don't know what grief is. So these kids do know what grief is, so they're not going to treat you different or they're not going to make fun of you. Like, oh, where's your dad? He's not picking you up. Like, you know, those things come up. Um, so I feel like it's taught me like to really appreciate what I have and also to really communicate um, my feelings. Like today I'm not in a good space or um, maybe I do need to take a break. Maybe I need to, you know, wash my face to relax for a minute. And it's just, um, it's just hard um, right now, especially because it's like your kid is asking you like, oh, what's, what's going to happen? And you can't really answer them, but you have to tell them like, I'm going to be here for you and whatever it is, we're going to get through it. And um, I think he appreciates that, like my honesty, like, I was like, London, I don't know. They sent me an email and they said remote. And this is what we're going to have to do. And I'll try to set up a Zoom meeting so you can see your friends. Um, so he has some kind of certainty and some kind of interaction. And also the good grief um, virtual meetings he goes to. So I, I hope that answered it. <laughs> I don't know if I did or not. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. How about Jess and Jerry, any thoughts from kind of your own experiences of loss and sorrow in your life um, might look different from it has for others, but I think from those experiences, we can draw lessons. Any kind of takeaways 
on that front for the two of you too? This is not so much about loss, but one thing that really stuck out to me, what Melissa said that I think is so important for kids is transparency um, and for parents to be really, I believe in reassurance as a clinician. That said, kids get when there are things going on in your home, if it's either mourning or if it's financial hardship or, you know, insecurity, food insecurity, things like that. And the idea of transparency, yes, we as a family or, or, and community are going through this. That said, we have love, we have ways to work through it. And I think that that's really important, both with grief and also with just getting through a hardship is having the transparency that yes, it's hard, but we have the skills to get through it. Um, even if it doesn't mean financially, you have the means, you may have the love and the support. Thank you. Yeah, um, and I, Jesse, I have to thank Good Grief for what I'm about to say. So um, we, we, re we reached out and, and got in touch with Good Grief a little over a year ago um, in my role as principal in the school that I was working in, we, we had an experience with a nine-year-old girl who was terminal. And, and it, it was probably the most um, grueling experience um, that, that, that I've ever had to go through, that we as a school community had to go through. And um, I didn't know what to do with it. I'll be quite honest with you. I had, I didn't, I knew what was going to come, but I didn't know what to do and how everybody was going to react and how to support everybody. So prior, prior to her passing, we, um, another administrator and I went down to Princeton and, and, and listened to some of, some of the advice that you were giving to us. And I think that experience, that experience of having gone through that, that training is the thing that is getting me through now. Um, I, I still haven't processed and finished everything with with the death of the young lady, but um, I know that in my actions and in my work that I'm doing, I've changed a lot. I, I've definitely changed a lot. And I think it goes back to something that Melissa said earlier, like, oh, are you okay? Can I do something for you? Those are things that, that because you just so desperately want to help and you want to give support that you don't realize the how bad that might be, you know? And, and I think in, in what you were, you know, in, in the way you were telling us and, and, and explaining to us the way to, to approach things, um, it, it helped us to stop doing that. You know, don't, don't ask somebody, what can I do for you? I'm here if you need me, tell me what you need. You're giving them another assignment. You're giving them another task. Now they're stressed because now they have to come to you and say, I'm okay. And, not, and they have to worry about you feeling bad for them. And, and, and it adds and it adds and it doesn't take away. So I, I think that what I learned from my experience with, with um, dealing with that grief and dealing with that loss is that we, are, we can be more intuitive. We know how people are feeling right now. We don't know exactly what's going on in everybody's head, but we do know that we're all suffering loss and we know what it feels to suffer a loss and we know what comforts us. So if we could be a little more intuitive and, and, and take that empathy that we have, and instead of asking, just get it, understand it, and, and then do something for somebody that they didn't ask you to do, but you know is going to, is going to help them. That, that to me, um, we've, we've kind of created a culture in that school that I, that I came from where that's how we operate and that we get it, you know, and everybody, everybody takes a turn being, you know, you're allowed to, to, to feel bad one day and it's okay and you don't have to fix it. You just, you don't have to say anything and you don't have to give the advice. You just maybe shut up and listen and, and let somebody, you know, let, let, let people process what they have to process, how they have to process it and let them know that they're not alone. And I think that from good grief was able to come back into our staff and to, to train our staff with, the, with that, with that outlook. I think it, it, it's helped tremendously. And I, and I have to thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I think I'm going to build on this and uh, kind of a theme that I'm drawing out and I, I want to put it back as a question is this idea of, you know, there, there is a lot of increased isolation for that said number of times. Um, that like for Jess, you are working with adolescents, they're at this critical time where they should be kind of having more social connections, but they're not. Um, that there is, you know, a lot of collective grief and sorrow, but I've also started to hear this kind of theme of 
the importance of honesty and transparency and talking with our kids about these kinds of experiences. So I wonder if the three of you have any suggestions for our audience today about, you know, from the seat that you sit in as parent, administrator, social worker, the best way to go about kind of creating opportunities for educators, for parents to talk with and be transparent with their kids and how to do that, how to do that with the kind of vulnerability and courage that this kind of situation requires. Cause it can be scary for people to talk about situations like this with kids. So I wondered if the three of you had some advice for, for our audience on how to go about doing that. I mean, I, I think the, the starting point when you're dealing with children is start with their parents and maybe have that conversation first with parents. Um, you wanna be on the same page in, in the conversation and um, you wanna set a tone of calm. There's honesty and there's hysteria and you don't want to you don't want to create you don't want to create something that's that's going to make people fearful. You want to just be be honest and supportive. Um, starting with parents and discussing how together you can talk to children. I think that was something that that was successful for us, and in, in that we we kind of approach those things together as a team, school and parent together in speaking in speaking with kids and 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 you know letting them ask the questions, but um, helping them ask the questions because sometimes they don't have the words depending on the age of the child. So we kind of help them um, to, to ask them and um, to just give that, that, that information to the parents. Sometimes they were very uncomfortable in, in talking and, and they needed us as, as the backup for that. So that, that partnership was, I think, um, crucial to, to, to being transparent that we're all on the same page. Um, I think I agree with Geraldine. We're talking with um, the school, especially my son's teacher, because um, when his father passed when he was eight, um, that year of school, he didn't really talk at all. And his teacher said he never brought it up. He just, you know, was under the rug. He doesn't want to talk about it. And then, um, Slash to now, his teacher knows he talks about it with, you know, his friends. Um, but speaking directly with the teacher and her aide, like them giving me feedback on how he interacts in school and what he does and how he gets away with certain things. <laughs> um, let me know and build a relationship with them, how to, how to, you know, talk to him and be transparent and honest with him and know that. I'm calm in that I'm not going to react a certain way because I'm the mom. Certain things he could do at school or with his friends, he doesn't really want to do in front of his mom. Um, so I think have building that like village where I talk to his therapist at Good Grief, I talk to his teacher, um, or even at um, when we were going to Sunday school, his Sunday school teacher. Um, just having that communication, because even I think about when I was a kid, you act a certain way around in a certain environment. So your mom might not know how you do certain things when you're at church or when you're at the grief. Or, but your mom also knows who you are as a kid. So it's like you have to like get these little bits and pieces of your child. Um, and right now it's like mostly virtual. So he's always on his iPad. So sometimes I'm like, who is he talking to on his iPad? I don't know if he's in a group chat with strangers or um, like he told me one day he was on Roblox and somebody tried to get his address. And he said, well, my teacher told me anybody who tries to find out your address, you know, you report them, you get their name, you tell me right away and he texts me. So I was appreciative that open communication and knowing that the school is doing the same thing. Like that's a big issue or like, um, uh, was it Fortnite when they try to scam and get your credit card information from your child so they could get money off the account. Like there's so many different things going on that if I didn't have this communication with school and therapists and talking to him about what he's doing on his iPad,
I think Melissa might have frozen. Might have lost connection. Should or I have been noticing such and such? There you are. Sorry, Melissa, you froze. Sorry. <laughs> All right, Jess, let's go ahead and transition to you, yeah. Um, I, I have actually a few bullet point lists that I like to, and I've been throughout the pandemic giving um, suggestions to parents on what to do at home. So I'd, I'd like to actually kind of do that, um, yeah, just because yeah. I think some good suggestions. Yeah. Um, again, I work with high schoolers, so this is a little geared towards older students though with tweens and middle school students, some of this will um, work as well. It's gonna be a little different than elementary though. So I apologize, but I'm not a clinician with elementary school kids. Um, so the first is um, plan a gathering one time a day. Um, I think the over engaging with your kids ends up kind of being detrimental and then therefore fighting happens. Um, and one thing I've been telling parents is do not ask accomplishment-based questions right now um, because kids are not feeling that they're accomplishing what they usually do. Um, I, I think we're all feeling that, honestly. So just assume your kids are feeling the same way. They're not really reaching the goals that they are normally wanting to. So, you know, ask them how they're doing, but not like, what, did you finish this assignment? What grade did you get? That kind of thing, because it's just gonna end up exploding. Um, the second piece of advice that I've been telling families is 100,000% devices out of the room at bedtime, which I promise will cause a fight. Um, I promise it will, but once you get that going um, and have that be a norm to have the devices out of the room. I have been working with so many kids and families this past semester um, who are so greatly sleep deprived um, because they're using devices. And I will tell you, um, depression, anxiety, and suicidality really gets perpetuated when kids are sleep deprived. So just, have the fight, but get the device out of the room at night. Um, the third thing is, and Melissa, you spoke about this, um, is scheduling um, social time with friends. May it be Zoom time, may it be going to the park safely. Um, again, kids don't really wanna be at, you know, hanging out with their parents all the time, no offense parents, but they don't. So I think it's important to just recognize this and figure out an alternative. Um, the next thing is anger and frustration. Um, I think it's important to remember, and if you think about this with fighting with um, a family member or a spouse or a friend, um, there's always something underneath it when you're angry. Um, kids are the same way. So if they are yelling at you, if they're being explosive, um, if they're frustrated, you know, Try to let it slide a little bit and figure out what's going on underneath because I promise you there, there is something. Um, again, the reassurance just to feel some kind of solid grounding, even if there is chaos in the house financially, um, with grief, with mourning, any of that, just still knowing the love and the support is there. And then the final thing I've been telling parents is um, really finding simple joys right now can be really um, beneficial. Even if it's sitting as a family watching a movie together, um, that kind of security in this time of chaos, because it is, again, none of us really know what is happening in two weeks or tomorrow, you know? We're really, it's a chaotic time. Those little board games, a movie together, any kind of simple interaction, um, families are finding that brings a lot of ease to them. So I really recommend the simple interactions with your kids. And then also reach out to clinicians. Therapy is so important. I tell this to everyone. I'm in therapy, everyone should be in therapy. So reach out to clinicians. Um, there are many public numbers to call to get support. Um, within insurance, without insurance, you can find support. So I, I say to everyone, it's don't put it all in your hands and also as parents get support as well. Yeah. Awesome, thanks Jess, those are some great, 
um, tips for all of us. Um, I'm just being aware of time, uh, Lisa, and I think I'm going to go ahead and open it up for Q&A from our audience because I we wanted to give about 10 minutes or so for questions from the group and then uh, we'll take about five minutes at the end just to kind of do a, a few um, you know, logistical pieces uh, there. So um, I just throw it out to, to the group who's here, our audience. If you have questions, you could either put them, um, the, the best spot is in the Q&A box. You can um, click on that in the little Zoom tab at the bottom, or if you want to type them into the chat too, uh, we will try to um, gather all the different questions that we can for our panelists. Yeah, there's one question from Joseph. Um, on the Q&A about, and you don't all have to answer all of these, but he was, he thought it was important to bring mental health first aid into this. And he wanted to know if you guys as, as either parents or administrators were aware of um, this training and who the, he feels is um, helpful as, for the school community at large. Is that something that you guys have had experience with? I'm trained in that. I did that after Katrina and I was working with kids on Staten Island um, and just going through the trauma. Um, absolutely mental health first aid um, and clinicians in schools and school counselors in schools hopefully are getting the support they need to be providing those services. If they're not, call out your school on it because they should be. Sorry, superintendent, but I do believe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There was also on the chat early on, someone brought up the, you know, specifically how to support Maria, how to support people with anxiety. And I think, Jesse, you actually spoke to this and all of you did. But one thing that stuck out to me when you said that really rang a bell for me, Jesse, was when you talked about not being um, achievement focused, not sort of zeroing in on what have you done today and did you get an A and is it all done? I think that really, you know, as well, is something that we all need to hear. We can't hear too much. And I didn't know if you had any other thoughts about that, about how to manage anxiety for kids at this point. I, again, put it out on the table, be transparent with kids and also acknowledge you understand their anxiety as a parent. You, you want to be a grounding force for your children, but you can also share with them that you understand because it's an anxious time. Um, and I think that kind of both and of, um, yes, I feel your anxiety and also I'm here to support you. And that said, again, I'm going to keep saying, get a therapist. If your child is experiencing a lot of anxiety, because I will tell you this is a, um, this is a common theme myself included, because uncertainty, we don't do well with that as anyone. So um, really reach out, but, but um, have your kids express it and talk about it because sometimes you'll find that what they find as the anxious things are actually things you can settle. And I'm sure Melissa, and um, I'm not a parent yet, but I'm sure there are ways as a parent you can ground them by um, explaining, you know, like the ghosts that are in the closet. Okay, you can talk through it and get them down. So it's the same way with the COVID anxiety. Um, there are some things that you as parents or as caretakers understand that you can kind of, um, you know, deviate it and uh, bring it down for them. So something we have in, in all of our schools is a support service team. And traditionally it focused on, you know, kids who are struggling academically, but the focus moving into the, this new year is is not necessarily academic. It's more, we're really more focused on, on checking in with how our kids are feeling mentally and socially. And, and that's, that's the key. And our social workers and our school nurses are a very big part of the plan for next year and how that team is going to operate. Um, we, we can't worry. We have to, you know, we have to educate and we have to care about the education, but we can't, but they're not available. Students are not available for that unless they're, they're mentally ready for it. So that, that, that's um, part of our training with our staff is to identify when students are in crisis or, you know, it's, it's easy when they're in front of you, when they're not there, how are you, how are you checking in? How are you getting that information? So that's the professional development that we're providing for staff 
to work with these support teams to really reach out, not, not just to be there if, if um, they need us, but to find them because we know that they're out there and we know that they need us. So what is it that we're going to be doing is getting in there and finding out and getting them and, 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 and bringing them into us. Excellent. Uh, I'm seeing a question here that I want to kind of pull out and put to the whole group. And I think, um, you know, Melissa, too, I'd love to hear what you think as a parent about this. Some ideas um, that educators could do to make the first days, month positive and calm and uh, joyful amongst uncertainty, loss, this fluid situation. Um, yes, yeah, so I'd love to hear from the three of you ideas on um, you know, what, what educators do, could do to kind of start the school year off on a good foot. I would say um, basic, I don't know if they could reach out to parents before and see what happened over the summer or since the end of the school year and just get a gist of what's been going on. That way they're not blindsided where a kid it, like explode and say, you know, I just lost my grandpa or, you know, whatever happened. Um, a little more detailed background before with the parent and the, and the teacher before things happen or say, oh, have they been doing social meetups with any of their friends? Have they been in camp or have they been, you know, at home by themselves isolated for the last three months? Like just to get like a, like a, a rundown or scoop about what's been going on with them before, you know, starting off with, oh, you have an assignment due on Friday. Did you check your <laughs> inbox? You know, so I would suggest that. Um, and just the open communication, find out how the parent likes to communicate. Whereas I'm at work, um, the teachers were emailing and I'm like, I'm in the middle of getting a patient ready or getting instruments ready. I can't. So she would text me and say, can we set up a meeting on your lunch break? Or just get that um, more personalized, you know, communication and method to speak with the parent and get, you know, the scoop of what's going on at home before jumping into uh, a full routine online. Yeah, that, that personal interaction is so important to making those connections, even if it's a phone call. Um, the teachers that, that we work with in Union City are amazing and I've seen them do some, go out of their way to do some amazing things to, to help the kids feel connected in the most isolating of times. Um, whether it be that they show up at school even though nobody's there, a little video, hey, how you doing to my class? And then you post it onto, the, you post it onto their Google Classroom or their Schoology or whatever, whatever you're using. Um, but just to, to see the face, to, to see something positive. We had teachers making videos, um, taking like an upbeat song and everybody like, I don't know what those things are because I'm old, but TikTok, whatever thing and passing something and, and just giving something happy to them. And it didn't take anybody more than a few minutes just to do a little piece. Um, Somebody, somebody in the staff putting it together and just showing, hey, we're still here. We still love you. We still care about you. Um, uh, parents, the PTO, going in and decorating the front of the school with signs. We, we still distribute meals. And I'm assuming everybody, every other school does that too. Um, and, and that's sometimes the only time the kids and the families get out is to go to pick up the meals for the week at the school. But there's, you know, signs and pictures from the teachers or, you know, like you can't celebrate the graduation, but all your teachers made you a sign in the note. And, and those things are so important that those things keep you connected when you don't have the, the traditional means. And it doesn't take a lot. It doesn't cost anything. It's, it, it's just that simple uh, personal interaction, like Melissa said. And, and that said, as a community, I, I 100% agree with of putting in the positivity. Um, and underneath that, there, 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 is, there has been an increase of um, suicidal ideation. Um, there has been an increase in depression, in anxiety, and um, we as schools, um, not all schools have social workers. Um, it's very problematic. Um, so we as schools need to be providing those resources to families and kids. And again, someone mentioned this in question, how do we do so if it's remote? Um, we're all trying to figure that out. Um, one thing that is really interesting is Younger kids um, 
even younger kids in high school, ninth and 10th graders, are less likely to share a friend's name through using their own name if their friend is in a state of crisis, whereas older kids, they're like, I don't care, I wanna you know, protect my friend. So they'll just come and say, sure, you can say it, I'm saving their life. Um, so what we have been doing in a school, and I recommend um, for parents as well to be doing, um, again, there's a lot on your plate, but another thing to be, is, is looking out um, and seeing if you're seeing a change in your child, if you're seeing them more isolated, if you're seeing them, um, eating disorders have been coming up recently, a lot more eating disorders, um, because again, it's about control. Um, so it's really looking out for the different symptoms of different disorders um, and then reaching out to either the school and finding resources, your doctor. Um, in New York City, we have um, NYC Well. Um, I'm in New Jersey. I, New Jersey actually has a better, um, their school system deals with suicidality a lot better than the New York school system. So I'm impressed with New Jersey in that, but um, I don't know the resources in New Jersey. But what I do know is reach out for resources um, because kids, you know your kids best and you will see those changes and transitions and know that schools are aware of this. We can't necessarily weed out in the same way, but no judgment on school's part. Reach out to us and we can provide services very quickly. Um, I do want to say one person made a comment and it's just quickly. Um, it's very hard to find child psychiatrists. Um, there are very few child psychiatrists. Um, I would recommend reaching out to mental health clinics if you can't afford it because they usually are very expensive out of pockets. And also many hospitals will have a child psychiatry department. That may be a good way as well, but child psychiatrists are hard to find. I'm sorry. Um, check with your doctor for a referral as well. Yeah, unfortunately I know that there are counties in New Jersey that have none in that county. So they, they are very hard to find. Um, I think, you know, a big takeaway, I'm just gonna kind of wrap up um, this Q and A time because we are tight in time and I wanna let people go um, at, at the time that we had laid out, but I just wanna kind of sum up a lot of this. And I think big takeaway for me in all of this is the importance of kind of coming back to the basics of bringing people together, creating opportunities for connection, opening up good lines of communication with our kids, looking out for any potential like warning signs and things that might be problematic in them and, and not being embarrassed or ashamed to reach out and ask for help as a parent, an educator, um, a child, anybody when you need it. Um, so some really, really great takeaways. I'm already seeing some thank yous from people um, to our panelists and their perspectives. And I just wanna again, thank the three of you. Um, thank you to Lisa as well for helping me to moderate the discussion. I, I felt like there was some really good um, kind of takeaways. And I, I am sorry if we didn't get to your questions. I know there were some others in there we didn't address. Um, you will get an email from me um, following up with this. Feel free to email me if you have some questions you wanna get answered. I'm sure if there are some specific um, to Jess or Jerry or Melissa, they would probably be more than happy if I forward those on to them. Um, same with Lisa as well. So if you have a question for one of them, I'd be happy to forward those things along. Um, and again, just thank you again to our panelists for being here. Uh, a couple of resources that I wanna share in our, in our time closing. Um, at Good Grief, I've mentioned this previously, we have this Good Grief Schools program now, and this is a program that was built before COVID, but it just has become kind of increasingly relevant with everything going on. So we offer a variety of different things, including parent education, virtual you know, webinars, professional development done virtually. We train people in schools to run peer support groups around grief and loss. And then our Roots to Resilience program is a social and emotional learning program that's all about coping skills and adapting to adversity in our lives. So pulling back and having that kind of larger conversation about how we navigate through difficult experiences. If you're interested in that program, you can visit the website, reach out directly to me, and I can share more information. We also have lots of free resources on our website related to grief and loss through COVID and other situations as well. Um, feel free to check out the website, good-grief.org slash COVID-19. I'm going to put this into the chat. 
Um, and then last but not least, we do have some upcoming um, virtual learning opportunities, including a couple of full day trainings around understanding grief and loss. We do offer um, continuing education credits through that, one in October, one in December. This is one of the trainings that actually Jerry referenced earlier coming down and joining us for. So if you're interested in that, these are gonna be held virtually this, um, uh, this fall. Uh, we'd love to have you join us. Um, and then I'm gonna also give a plug for this one on October 21st, which uh, Lisa will be leading along with Carol Geithner. It's a narrative writing workshop. This one is kind of uh, gonna be capped in size. It's gonna be much smaller, will be much more interactive in nature and is uh, really focused on uh, providing an opportunity for educators to engage in their own self care, to reflect on the impact of this experience through writing. And the two of them are very skilled at this and have a lot of experience. So I know that that will be a really great um, workshop as well. You can register for those workshops online um, at goodgriefschools.org. There was a question about are the trainings webinars free? These full day, the full day ones and this webinar are not free. Um, because we are offering CE credits, we are trying to kind of just offset some of those costs. But as always, if the costs are prohibitive to you in any way, reach out to me, just let me know. Not an embarrassing thing. We offer scholarships and things like that to join us. So please let me know if it's a challenge for you, but you would like to participate in that. Um, finally, please, 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 I'm putting this in the chat, fill out our survey. You'll get this in the automated response email as well. Let us know what you thought of this webinar. Share ideas for future webinars. We will continue to offer these uh, free webinars like this over the course of the year and we will um, share all of those with you. So again, thank you everybody so much for being here. Thank you to Jess and Jerry and Lisa and Melissa so much for your time and sharing your perspectives. And I am wishing you all the very best as we head into this school year. I hope you all stay safe and healthy and please, please, please keep focusing on connection and caring for one another um, through this time. So thank you everybody and have a great day. Yeah. <laughs>